Hello and welcome to uh, In Conversation and I'm joined today by uh, Ian Forrester from David. Uh, myself, my name is Tom Saunter, I'm Mediacom's Global Head of Creative and Media Technologies within Creative Systems and I'm responsible for our Creative Analytics solution which combines the very latest AI technologies with the media data um, that we have on behalf of clients plus new ways of understanding creative. So I'm going to be introducing you to Ian. We're going to talk about his uh, product, David, which we've just announced our partnership with. Ian, tell us about yourself and a little bit about the company. Hey, so my name's Ian and I'm CEO of David. And I've been working on David for uh, about three and a half years now. So prior to that, I used to work at Unruly and Whaler. I set up inside teams over there and it's really at Unruly where I started my relationship with Mediacom. So we worked with Matt Mee and Panaki Dutt, based out of Singapore, um, looking at the cultural connections data and predicting how content was going to perform across borders. And that's where my relationship with Mediacom started. And we're just super excited to continue it into 2022 with our, with our new relationship just getting on. So tell us what makes David unique in the marketplace. So um, it's really the combination of technology and data which we're ingesting. So it's this mix and blend of technologies which allows us to do what we do. So we're ingesting a bunch of different computer vision APIs for a start to understand what's happening within content. So not just using a, an Amazon recognition or a Google Vision or one of the big boys, but blending those outputs of the big guys with some smaller players, so people like Kairos and you know, Analytic and Clarify, to get a really deep understanding of what's happening within content. That's kind of one side of it. The other part which we're feeding the AI system is a bunch of performance data. So you understand what's happening within content, but how is that content performing? And that's what really sets us apart because a lot of the industry is focused on quite simple metrics, things like impressions, and likes, and click-through rate, and use-through rate, and all this kind of stuff, which is interesting but it's not going to tell you why content is performing in a certain way. So when we gather our training data, when we collect our training data, we're testing content among humans, and we're generating from that human response a bunch of interesting sets of data. So we're using facial coding mm -hmm. to get expressions, we're using eye tracking to see what people are looking, mm -hmm. we're using a survey technique to understand the emotions which people are, people are feeling, so what the emotions which are is evoking among people. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we're also ingesting data from our partners, so you guys have, have, have given us some data way back when, like 2019, we ingested a bunch of campaign data, we're looking at sales data from clients as well, social data, and it's really this mix of data which allows us to make the predictions which we make. So, it's the depth and breadth of that data which sets us apart. So if media provides the nudge and emotions are the thing to untangle, um, how does David untangle that complex emotional problem through technology? That's a great question. So understanding emotional responses is not an easy thing to do. And there are many different techniques and many different ways of understanding emotions and measuring emotions. We use a mix of those techniques because we, we feel that any one of them doesn't tell the full story. So with David we found that a mix of both biometrics and survey technique gives us the full picture. In terms of biometrics we're using facial coding. Mm -hmm. So facial coding is when you film someone's face as they're watching content. You're understanding where they're smiling or where they're frowning and that will tell you which parts of the video are evoking a positive or a negative response, which is super interesting and really cool in itself. But that only goes so far in terms of giving you an understanding of the emotions being evoked by content, because only six expressions appear on the face which can be recognized, so the smile, disgust, sadness, shock, and so on, which each have their own expression. Mm. So you get some granularity, but only a certain amount. To go deeper and understand which emotions are being felt, the way to do it, frankly, is, is to ask someone what they felt, but not ask them to, not ask them and give them a, a free reign, what, what did you feel? You need to put some kind of categorization around that response. So you ask them within a framework, 
and our framework is the David 39. So 39 emotions which we've identified as being distinct from one another and which we've drawn from academic studies. Mm. And the cool thing about that is once you understand those 39 emotions, you get that granularity of response. You know? So you're getting that depth of understanding and it's the, that depth which tells you why content is working or not. Should we, should we use a worked example? Is there a, an idea of a campaign that you think could have had a stronger emotional impact if they really understood these 39 drivers? Almost any campaign could, could benefit from this kind of analysis because, unfortunately, the metrics which most advertisers are using to understand content are just not fit for purpose, mm. frankly. Advertisers are using metrics like impressions, views, clicks, view through rate. Now, all this stuff is important, you need to understand it, but it doesn't tell you, none of it tells you why something is happening. Um, and this is kind of a, a major gap in the industry because advertisers are measuring the wrong things. Mm. And so they're not then able, if you're measuring the wrong things, you're not managing how you're creating your content. To, to measure, to manage something, you need to measure it. Peter Drucker did that once. And if you're measuring emotions properly, you can then manage them. If you're not doing that, then the chances are you are going to be creating content which is not optimized and which is a bit meh, which we see all the time. So one, one example uh, would be if you look at the Super Bowl, for instance, any Super Bowl has maybe two or three big winners and the rest is just this morass of stuff. It's like a microcosm of, of advertising generally. And if you look at something like, I don't know, avocados from Mexico, mm. for instance, that particular Super Bowl ad this year featured a bunch of people at the Coliseum and they'd all gone to see a gladiator fight, right? So they've come from miles away, they're from different parts of the empire and they're talking about their three week cart journeys and you know there's a few like quips and stuff and you know it's all kind of like okay. And then someone, one of the characters then whips out a bunch of guacamole and suddenly they're having guacamole and chips and it's just like okay well where did that come from? What, what does guacamole have to do with ancient Rome? <laughs> Very little I, I would suggest and, and so you know it's not terrible, it's not an awful, like, people don't hate it but it's not going you know, to elevate other yeah. colors from Mexico up there. Particularly in, in the Super Bowl when some people spend time. So the premise is you think any brand can improve the relevancy by better understanding the emotional drivers of their creative. But if it's survey based, how can that ultimately be scalable? Another great question. So the survey based data is the basis for what we're creating. It's, okay. It forms the it forms part of the training data set. Okay. Which we are using to build the AI which will then allow us to scale. I see. So within the training data, we have a bunch of videos that we're, we're testing, and we're still showing those videos to humans within the training data set. So you get a bunch of content, show that content mm -hmm. to humans. We're doing our facial coding, our eye tracking, mm -hmm. and also a survey to get a really rich understanding of how those humans are responding to that content. So it's updating all the time. Absolutely, where that, that needs to be updated all the time <clears throat> because how people respond to stuff changes over time. Yeah. Like something, a piece of content that was released pre COVID mm. versus now mm. is likely to have a very different response because content is not viewed in a bubble, it's viewed within, it's viewed through the lens of the context within, within, within which it's viewed, right? So what's happening in the world will dictate and will influence how people are responding to that content. That's one side of the performance data set. We're also understanding automatically what is happening in that content. And that is being driven by computer vision. So we're taking those assets which will form part of the training data set and we're testing that content with computer vision. So we're running it through various computer vision APIs and we are understanding what's happening in that mm. content. So we've got two data sets then we've got what's happening and how people are responding to it and the David system then correlates the two and says when we see this, when we see executive wearing lovely glasses and a pink shirt, thank you very much, <laughs> um, we tend, uh, someone in the UK will tend to respond in a certain way. We understand the correlations between those things and then when we see in a video executive in his nice glasses we, we can predict how people are going to respond because we've seen that before. 
ultimately we could take out some of the um, more qualitative, therefore less scalable uh, mechanics behind understanding this, this effectiveness, which is so intangible otherwise. Um, very, very exciting. Of course, we see in the industry a lot of other um, new tools and approaches, specifically around how AI can help us crack the code here. On that, in a more general sense, uh, where do you think this all goes next? Um, is this something that you guys are thinking about? 100%. So, fundamentally, the industry is facing a number of seismic challenges. So, if you consider the proliferation of content, like the fact that there is so much content being produced now by individuals with their smartphones, like everyone's producing images, videos all the time, but influencers producing tons of content for brands. Like every, every brand campaign now needs a TikTok and a news feed and a carousel and a bloody skittle and all this. You know, everyone's adding to it, yeah. which means that. Whenever anyone goes online, you're bombarded by all this stuff, mm. right? This kind of morass of, of, of stuff which, you know, and you've only got a certain amount of attention that we can pay to stuff. So the fact that there's just so much content right now is the first problem which the industry is having to respond to. Added to that, you've got the fact that the cookie is pretty much dead, very soon will be dead. So targeting, the cookie-based targeting will be no longer. A cookie based measurement will also be no longer. <clears throat> and then you've got the fact that A B testing is not really possible in the way that it used to be given the changes to iOS and the fact that you can no longer run seemingly infinite combinations of ad types and of ways of testing and audiences. Because of changes to iOS, you can only run 100 combinations in a particular campaign versus thousands previously, which then wasn't aware of that. <laughs> it's really so it's totally limiting the way that you can. Because before you could try, you could trial a hundred different small, small changes in, in, in creative, and you could pump it out to a hundred different audiences if you wanted to, and see which combinations worked, and then, and then mm -hmm. go from there. Mm -hmm. That's not longer, no longer going to be possible. So this, these three things are converging, <clears throat> and frankly, they mean that advertising needs a new paradigm. It needs it needs to shift the way we think about content and content effectiveness and particularly how we measure and how we decide some content is working or not needs to shift. <clears throat> the ways of, of measuring of old are no longer relevant and so you know we feel we're perfectly positioned given our focus on metrics that matter, given our scalability, given the fact that we don't use cookies that never have never will. We feel we're kind of perfectly placed at the apex of all this stuff to help the industry make a massive shift. I think we should end on some rapid fire questions. Get to know each other a little better, what do you say? Yeah. Okay, good. this is something that we do within our Medicom podcast as well, so I've always wanted to be the question master. Uh, what is your favorite line in from a poem, song or book? My favorite quote generally is a classic one from Henry Ford. And it's, um, <laughs> whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. And this is kind of like quite important for me in my formative years around like, you know, self-doubt and anxiety and, and all that crap which goes on in every, inside everyone's heads. Like if you don't think you can, then you definitely you can that save your stuff. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you think you can, then you, as much as about thinking you can, it's about then focusing on that goal mm -hmm. and persevering. It's not like a straight line between think I can and mm -hmm. success, obviously. But thinking you can and continuously thinking you can and dealing with the ups and downs of life being persistent will take you to where you want to be, 100% it will, if you don't give up. That for me was was really important. I think my favourite Henry Ford quote is, you can have any colour you like as long as it's black. <laughs> That's it, mate. Ian, in your business career, what has been the hardest lesson to learn? Hardest lesson to learn has been the fact that you are in control of how you respond to stimuli, whether it gets you down or whether you respond in a positive way and take the learnings from it. That's a good goals. entrepreneurial stance to take. Yeah. Um, okay, different tack here. Um, uh, in your spare time, imagine your ideal dinner party. Which five guests would you invite to a dinner party at Shea Ian? <laughs> Um, great question. 
Um, Benjamin Franklin. Roger Federer. Okay. I love Roger Federer. Okay. I just think he's awesome. Like he's just uh, a bastion of ability, of attitude, and grace. Like, I just think he's just got such an amazing attitude. Um, Eckhart Tolle. Okay. Um, spiritual leader and uh, grandmaster, the Zen grandmaster of all things meditation and and um, unfolding. I think this, yeah, the most spiritual person on earth, probably. Um, I would say Sarah Woods, my old CEO, and really, who I love and is one of the best amazing people I've met. Ever and was incredibly important to me in my career. Um, and then probably Tony Robbins. Okay. Who's, um, yeah, an incredibly knowledgeable and um, a powerful man. Like the way he takes concepts and makes them super interesting and, and memorable and emotive um, and has massively impacted the lives of people around the world. I think it's really powerful. Sounds like a good inspirational dinner party. Um, finally, where in the world, real or fictional, uh, would you like to live and why? Place in the countryside, English countryside. Mm -hmm. Can't beat it. It's rainy, but mm -hmm. beautiful. And a place on the beach. Because I love the beach. My dogs love the beach as well. Okay. Good answers there. I uh, maybe I'll see you on the beach. Yeah. <laughs> One day. Um, all right, guys. Thank you very much for your time, Ian. Um, and uh, thank you for watching. <laughs>